of Van Ever Bush. An admirer has said, I always think of him as a Cape Codder. His roots are deep in the soil of that historic bit of sterile land. And metaphorically speaking, his shoes are full of its sand. In this summary, we can glimpse the force and crisp character of the man. During the last 40 years, Dr. Bush has been one of the nation's leaders in the great onrush of science and engineering. Today, in the workshop at his home in Belmont, Massachusetts, he is still busy working at his hobbies and the newest of his long list of inventions. Of these, he is best known for his analytical machines, which were pioneers in the evolution of computer technology. Dr. Bush has served as Dean of the School of Engineering at MIT and now is Honorary Chairman of the MIT Corporation. As an administrator of scientific research, he guided the work of the Carnegie Institution for 17 years. Throughout the years, he has also applied his know-how to industry. He was one of the founders of the Raytheon Manufacturing Company. And he has been chairman of the board of Merck and Company. Today on Science Reporter, we are going to look back over the years with this extraordinary man and share his views on some of the great events of his time. John Fitch, MIT science reporter. We're at the home of Dr. Van Ever Bush in Belmont, Massachusetts. During World War II, Dr. Bush was the organizer, guiding spirit, and driving force of our nation's scientific efforts in a global conflict. As director of the Office of Scientific Research and Development, he was responsible for mobilizing the forces which produced many of the technological advances that played an important part in the winning of the war. Dr. Bush worked closely with Presidents Roosevelt and Truman, and in effect was the first of our scientific advisors. He shared the enormous responsibility for the development and use of our most fearsome weapon, the atomic bomb. Let's meet Dr. Bush. John, good to have you here. Well, Dr. Bush, this is certainly a beautiful home that you have here. I think it's a very nice one. We built it soon after the war, some eight years ago, some after soon after I came up from Washington eight years ago, and it worked out very well. Well, let's uh, start off by going back to 1945 in New Mexico when you witnessed the first atomic bomb blast. What was your personal reaction then? Well, of course, my first reaction was one of great relief that the program had been successful and the bomb had gone off on schedule. Well, now, when you go look back from a vantage point of 18 years, do uh, you have any regrets about it? No. Of course, President Truman made the decision to use the bomb, but I thought then, and I think now, that he was right, for a number of reasons. One, by ending the war abruptly, it saved 100,000 or more American casualties. It saved the lives of Japanese, for that matter. Then, too, uh, the bomb was bound to appear, and I think it as well that it appeared in a dramatic fashion, so that civilization would face up to it as it wouldn't have if uh, it had come in in some test way. Mm. And uh, the world has got to live with it and had to learn to live with it. I also think that it's well that the bomb came into effect in our hands, not in the hands of some other country, perhaps Russia. Now, what might have been some of the alternatives to uh, developing a bomb? Well, you hear people say today that everything would be lovely if uh, there were no A-bomb, if we could abolish it. What happened was not the production of an A-bomb simply, it was the modern application of science and engineering to warfare. If we had no A-bombs today, we might be thoroughly worried about the possible advent of, let's say, biological warfare, which in my opinion is a more horrible thing and uh, a much more threatening thing to civilization. Fortunately, pushed in the background today. Well, now, what about uh, other weapons of warfare at that time. There were some that were uh, pretty devastating in addition to the bomb. Oh, yes. The fire raids on Tokyo were much more horrible than any A-bomb on Nagasaki. Uh, 
They killed many innocent people in terrible circumstances. Yet I heard no protests on the use of firebombs because they were accepted. Standard weapons, conventional Standard weapons. Standard conventional weapons. I've read, too, that many of the scientists and engineers working on the bomb had moral qualms about it at the time. Was there any evidence of a struggle about this? No, some had qualms, and uh, those were expressed very carefully to Secretary Stimson and to President Truman. And every protest of that sort was further followed through. But there were very few who protested. I think nine out of ten scientists that had to do with it felt just as I did. I, uh I would like to quote one modern writer, a man named uh, Jacob Bronowski, who said that nothing happened in 1945 except that we changed the scale of our indifference to man. Do you agree with that, Steve? Well, I don't, know, I don't quite understand what he's talking about, but uh, what happened was that uh, science, which had piled up uh, great resources of fundamental knowledge, became suddenly applied to warfare in a very thorough way. And the result was proximity fuses and radar, a hundred things. Anti-submarine weapons, direct guided missiles, rockets. It was bound to happen. That's the thing that happened. And that's the thing that civilization has to learn to live with. The application of science produces beneficial things and it also produces dangers to the race. The great thing that happened is that science became thus applied. Well, don't you think it's sort of a paradox that uh, this tremendous instrument of warfare, the greatest we've ever known, may very well be the strongest uh, force for peace in our time? There's no doubt that since the war, we've had a stalemate. Uh, we have today uh, a determination on the part of uh, Russia and ourselves not to get into an all-out war because of the A-bomb. I think uh, we may be able to learn to live with it that way. Certainly, in my opinion, a deadlock of the sort that we have today is preferable to the situation we've had for some three or four thousand years of continual warfare, renewed every generation, devastating and just as cruel as any war. I'm glad we're out of that sequence. Well, as head of our uh, wartime research efforts, you must have been very alert to what was going on in other countries. Why was it that Germany, uh, which had been attempting to make an A-bomb, was unsuccessful? Because their organization was wrong, and because their scientists and their military, instead of cooperating, were fighting with one another. In fact, various ag agencies of the German government uh, were fighting with one an another during the war as vigorously as they fought with us. Their organization was terrible. They played Hitler's hunches, and they did everything wrong. Now, did you know this at the time? Oh, certainly. And we knew where they stood on the A-bar at the time. How was that possible? Well, I can tell you. In fact, I've got a book on that I'd like to show you. Let's go into the study a moment, and I'll show you that, because it's worth looking at. It's written by a man by the name of Goudsmith, Sam Goudsmith, and the name of a dissolved sauce. And I think you'll find it a fascinating affair. What Godsmit and his men found out in regard to German efforts on the A-bomb was really that they hadn't gotten to first base. Now, you ask me why. Let me give you Sam's words. The three German errors mentioned so far, complacency, deterioration of interest in pure science, and regimentation in the administrative control of science are the principal ones that we, too, can make if we're not on guard against them. But that's a great book. Well, now, what about the um, uh, Japanese? I don't believe they were working uh, on uh, atomic energy, were they? But how did they do in other well, technical fields? They didn't produce during the war any new weapons. They produced some new techniques of fighting and jungle fighting. But as far as any scientific application to weapons, there wasn't any. Even their airplanes? Their very well, their airplanes planes. were just copies. They're common mm -hmm. planes. Now, we worked pretty well with the uh, British, didn't we, sharing... Uh, Very work. well, indeed. We shared uh, all of our uh, reports. And we worked together on nearly every project and with great harmony. Mm -hmm. What was your uh, reaction to uh, Churchill? I believe you had an opportunity well, to... Well, of course, him. I'm a great admirer of Churchill, as everyone else is. 
I didn't like the way that he controlled British science. And I think a good many British scientists didn't like it either. But he was a great man, of course. What about the uh, Russians? How were they in technical matters during well, the war? Well, again, nothing new in the way of weapons came out of Russia. They uh, did enormous things in producing great masses of artillery and so forth, but no innovations that I know of that mm -hmm. amounted to anything. That's changed somewhat in the Oh, yes, it's changed years. very much. And uh, I can tell you the reason that it's changed, and it's an interesting one. Right after the war, I said that I didn't believe that Russia would produce much in the way of science or technology. And the reason was that their laboratories were all commissar-ridden. They were politically controlled, and uh, their programs were made up by communists who knew nothing about science. Mm -hmm. But they changed all of that a few years ago. They took their commissars out of the laboratory. They gave them their freedom. They gave them their entire opportunity to make their own programs. And the result was a great burst of scientific achievement and technological engineering achievement. It's the exuberance of newfound freedom, perhaps. Well, in this country, World War II was certainly an important turning point for uh, science. Uh, what about in the role of the uh, science advisor? How, was, how has that changed over the years since then? Well, uh, you spoke of me as being the first presidential advisor. Actually, my uh, post was somewhat different from that. I was advisor to the president. Uh, but uh, my principal job was running a government agency as an executive. On the other hand, Dr. Killian and Wiesner, the ones that have fallen in since the war, have been uh, advisors. Now, in both cases, in their case and in mine, we've never taken this as a matter of giving personal advice. My job, their job, was to get to the President of the United States the best possible scientific advice available anywhere in the country. That's in contrast with the situation they had in Britain. I and it's one thing that I think we did right. In the case of the British, it was the personal opinion of advisors. His personal opinion was very important. That was not the fault of the scientists, that was the fault of Churchill. That's the way he wanted it. I wonder if you'd care to comment on the increasing role and importance of that role of the scientist in our society and in government. Well, of course, we see it everywhere. Science has been remaking our lives in every way. It's going to do so in the future. And it's inevitable, therefore, that scientists and engineers have far more to do with government. Then, too, we have an enormous increase in the support by government of scientific work, which means a great uh, many scientists in this country are working indirectly for government. I understand it's something like two out of three. Something of the sort. And uh, that inevitably brings scientists in contact with government on all sorts of fronts as appointed men, usually, in the administrative branch, in the executive branch of government. Uh, scientists and engineers don't run for Congress very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, that's an interesting point. I wonder how they get along with uh, congressmen. Uh, well, their methods are quite different. I it? know they are, and I think you'll find this, that uh, scientists and engineers are getting along with Congress a lot better than they used to. There has been developing a mutual respect both ways. Scientists, for one thing, have discovered that the art of politics is a rather subtle art, mm -hmm. necessary for a democracy, not a thing to be learned overnight. And uh, the congressmen, the lawyers, and so forth, on the other hand, have found that scientists are fairly human mm -hmm. beings. We had a similar thing during the war. When the war started, uh, Military men and scientists were just like this. At the end of the war, they had developed mutual respect and they collaborated effectively, harmoniously. Do you see any danger of a certain scientific elite gaining uh, too much power in a situation like that? No, I don't. I hear it mentioned every little while. Of course, there is enormous power in the hands of some scientists, such as the one who heads the National Science Foundation. But, most of his decisions are made on the basis of recommendations of committees of scientists in the various fields. It's not very easy, you know, to dominate a group of scientists. They're about as independent a crowd as you can find anywhere. 
I just about as much think of dominating the scientists of this country as I would of a little clique running a faculty of a university. It isn't done. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> well, what about uh, this recent study uh, on the West Coast, I believe, which points out uh, an alleged irresponsibility on the part of uh, scientists who are uh, so busy working for the military in many cases that they're really not willing to take the responsibility for what well, is going to Well, it is charged right along that uh, scientists are now working for government so much that it uh, warps their judgment. That they uh, will recommend on the basis of what's going to make more money flow through the channel that they are connected with. There undoubtedly is some of that. Uh, there are some in every profession that would take that point of view. But my opinion, nine out of 10 scientists in this country give, asked to give their honest opinion to government for a matter that concerns the public interest will give their honest opinion without equivocation and without slant. And that's your, you feel that that's a responsibility? I think that's their attitude. responsibility and I think that's what nearly all of them will do. Well, Dr. Bush, you spoke about the relationship of the uh, politician to the scientist and the, the fact that they do uh, get along together, do understand. What about the rather larger problem of the whole mass of our citizenry, a uh, widening gap between science and the general public? How are they to learn more about science so that they can make intelligent decisions? That's quite a problem. Uh, incidentally, we keep talking about science. A great many of the things that we are talking about are really engineering accomplishments, and we ought to couple the two nearly every time. For example, in the atomic energy problem, after the scientists had got through, the bulk of the job was an engineering job done by chemical engineers, electrical engineers, and so on. But to come to your question, there is a great problem to keep the American public alerted on science on a, in a reasonable manner. Now, all of the media, television, radio, magazines, and so forth, not only help in that, but their presentation of science to the public is marvelously better than it was some years ago. It's improving all the time. And on the other hand, that is possible because the American public is acquiring a, uh, an understanding. The criticism that I have is this, that uh, the public generally naturally enough, is likely to be beguiled principally by the spectacular. The things that, uh, oh, so and a leg onto a chap who had it cut off or something, or mm -hmm. uh, space flights or something. Whereas uh, they do not do the study to understand the parts that are very much more uh, subtle. But <coughs> do you feel as uh, <coughs> the... Uh, as C.P. Snow has pointed out, that there is a, an unbridgeable gap uh, between the two cultures, that there's no hope for uh, people to understand the scientist or engineer. I disagree with C.P. Snow on that subject and on many others. There are indeed two cultures, but not the way he divides them. Oh, would you explain that? He would say that there is one that depends on science and one that depends on the humanities. They shall never meet and they're bound to diverge. No such thing. There are two types of culture. One, a pragmatic type, a practical affair, the culture that has to do with earning a living in the world and uh, working with organizations and uh, generally advancing the public benefit. And that includes, on the one hand, a knowledge of things, that is science, and a knowledge of men, the humanities. And only when those are emerged do you get a man who is truly cultured. Mm -hmm. But having said that, there is beyond that a second type of culture that has nothing whatever to do with practicality. Music, art, literature, the study of uh, things for the sake of knowing about them with no practical utility. Even such a thing as appreciating the sparkle of sun on a brook in the woods or the flight of a gull. That's all culture. And culture of the higher sort. Now, you can't teach that kind of culture. You can exemplify it. You can te teach the techniques that underlie it. But it is merely natural to a man 
who is living a full life. No man lives fully unless he partakes in one way or another of that second type of culture. So there is no unbridgeable gap between two cultures, you No feel? unbridgeable gap between those two cultures. And there are no such things as the two cultures that C.P. Snow talks about. Very interesting. Well, Dr. Bush, uh, having been aware of what's uh, important in science and technology and engineering in the past and being very much aware of what's going on at the present time, I wonder if you would uh, speak for a moment or two about what you feel are the significant advances that have been made. Oh, there are so many of them. You see, there are more scientists working today than were alive in the whole history of the race. And uh, science is going ahead on a hundred fronts at an accelerated pace, moving so fast that it's hard to keep up with the affair. And a, an advance that would have been regarded as spectacular a couple of decades ago, or three decades ago, may now be made and hardly be noticed because there was so much happening. But you can say this in general, that uh, the physical sciences made a great burst during the war, a great step forward after the war, and their applications flowed in in great number. Because the basic science, the fundamental science, had been done and was ready to be applied. Now we have a similar thing today in biology. A great mass of fundamental knowledge built up so that one day a dam will break. And this will begin to be applied in a thousand ways with the results that no man can predict. I think that's the most exciting thing that lies ahead. This fundamental knowledge you refer to as the new understanding of the genetic code? And well, that's one thing, but understanding of life generally. And of course, uh, mentioning the genetic code, I think uh, this business of breaking the genetic code is one of the most intriguing and exciting things that's going on today in science. Why do you say that? Well, here we have uh, a gene. You've got a few of them inside you. And uh, when you were born, or conceived rather, they proceeded to dictate how your body would be formed. They did it by sending out messengers to tell what cells to do what. The, the language that they used was a coded language. We are now breaking that code translating their language so that we can read the language of the genes. Now you can see what that might lead to. It certainly might. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of implications in just oh, understanding yes. it. Oh, yes. But it's not hard to understand. And uh, many a man, uh, it was a layman, lawyer, or physician or something, gets great pleasure out of following that particular advance because it is, uh, it's very intriguing indeed. There are dozens of laboratories working on it, you know. And one finds out one little thing and then somebody puts it all together. And gradually this whole thing is being translated. Yes, I think one uh, physician that I talked to marveled at it more because it was as though it had finally unlocked the real secret that gotten no, down to the basic essential. But all the way through biology, there are all sorts of things going on. We're getting a whole new understanding of physiology. Uh, the work that's being done on the way in which the nerves operate is fascinating. And the relations, the resemblances between the brain's operations and the operations of a modern analytical machine is a fascinating aspect of it. Speaking of analytical machines, this is something that uh, you pioneered in. Uh, what do you think about the, uh, the present-day computer and perhaps its uh, role in our future? Well, you said a minute ago that there was so much happening in the world that it'd probably be impossible to understand it or keep up with it. Well, that would be true if it wasn't for the fact that we have far better means of understanding than we used to have. Far better media of communication, far better ways of presenting things including the little job that you and I are doing, I hope. And uh, that's helping a great deal. But as time goes on, the analytical machine, which will supplement a man's thinking methods, which will think for him, uh, will have as great an effect on his grasp of the world and his access to data and so on, his manipulation of it. 
will have as great an effect in that way as the invention of the machine way back took the load off of men by giving them mechanical power instead of the power of their muscles. Do you see no dangers in the increasing reliance on the machine to think for us? Is it? No, I don't see any. Once in a while, uh, somebody that likes to write for spectacular purposes will talk about a race of self-reproducing machines that will take over civilization, banish humanity, like the old Frankenstein story. Well, we still believe in fairy tales, but uh, they're amusing, but that's all. Of course, uh, computers are closely related to um, automation. How do you feel about Very closely. That well, automation makes quite a problem. Uh, we have to realize two or three things in looking at that problem. Uh, first, they say that uh, every time you automate, you throw men out of work. Well, uh, that's not absolutely true, because every time you automate, you have to give employment to a lot of men to build and repair, install, and correct the automation. Rather, it's more clear to say that when you automate, you create skilled jobs and obsolete in unskilled jobs. And that does indeed make a problem. But we also have to think of this, that it's not while temporary dislocations are sad and we have to contend with them and so forth. And we have to prevent people from being thrown into distress through no fault of their own. Having said all of that, it's not a calamity if we learn to make uh, all the things we need for our civilized existence with less effort on our parts. Do you see then a greater leisure time sure, for all of Sure, certainly, certainly. Although I, I'm not at all sure what the American public's going to do with more leisure. Oh, that may be the real problem, then? Eh? <laughs> well, it may be. But uh, I've got a good deal of faith in the American public. They do some awfully queer things. But once in a while, they show their real caliber. And I'll tell you one time when they did, when it cheered me up good for another many years. That was when they endorsed and backed the Marshall Plan. The first time that any nation ever came voluntarily to the succor of other nations to see that they were helped out of the aftermath of the war. It was a magnificent thing to do and the American public was behind it. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Bush. We've been visiting Dr. Van Ever Bush at his home in Belmont, Massachusetts. This is John Fitch, MIT science reporter. This is NET, National Educational Television.